You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. The first presidential election in United States history wasn't really an election at all, at least not in the modern sense. There were no political parties, no nationwide popular vote, no stump speeches, town halls, or fiery debates. The system of electing a president today, with primaries, then general elections, and a rubber stamp by the Electoral College, was radically different in 1789. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3 of the Constitution provided for each state legislature to designate by whatever method it chose a number of electors equal to the size of its congressional delegation, the number of House members plus two for each state's senators. The purpose of this electoral college was to whittle down the large pool of regional candidates to a select few. In accordance with the Constitution, presidential electors gathered in their respective states Each elector would vote for two men, including one candidate who was not from the elector's home state. The electors would send their certified lists to Congress where votes would be counted. If a clear majority existed, the two top candidates would be president and vice president. If not, the decision would be left to Congress to choose a president from the top five candidates. Electors were not required to vote in any certain way, and there were no guidelines or rules related to running mates or political parties each individual elector was free to vote using their independent judgment. But in the first election of 1789, for most Americans, the matter was not subject to debate. There was only one choice for president, General George Washington. Washington was and is among the most famous men in American political history. There are dozens of cities, highways, estates, parks, and colleges named in his honor. Among them is the Washington Monument on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. On January 6, 2021, thousands of supporters of Donald Trump gathered less than a mile from this monument to hear the president repeat his unfounded claim that he won the 2020 election. But this year, using the pretext of the China virus and the scam of mail-in ballots, Democrats attempted the most brazen and outrageous election theft, and there's never been anything like this. It's a pure theft in American history. Everybody knows it. Just minutes later, President Trump urged his supporters to march to the Capitol building, telling them to fight like hell for their country. But whether or not Trump knows it, many of his most vocal supporters are already at the Capitol. On this day, lawmakers are due to come together to certify the election results from November, confirming Joe Biden as the next president of the United States. But Trump's unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud have stirred his supporters into a frenzy, and now they'll do anything to stop the democratic process. Before President Trump has even finished his speech, members of right-wing fringe groups begin pushing through temporary fencing that's in place to keep crowds away from Congress. The scattering of police on the perimeter of the Capitol are soon overwhelmed. A panicked officer radios in for help. But there's no stopping the surge of angry Trump supporters headed for the Capitol. What started out as a demonstration is rapidly descending into violence. Just after 2 p.m., rioters break through a window of the Capitol building and haul open the doors for others to follow them inside. At that moment, Congress is still in session, debating the validity of the election fraud claims. But the session is quickly gaveled into recess as the scale of the security breach becomes clear. Members of Congress are escorted to safety, and all attempts to confirm the result of the presidential election are abandoned. At least as of this moment, the rioters have achieved their goal of bringing America's democracy to a halt. Over the next few hours, Trump supporters rampage through the Capitol, breaking down office doors, assaulting police officers, and posting about their exploits on social media. One of the rioters is shot and killed by Capitol Police, and one officer suffers from two strokes and dies after being pepper sprayed. It takes hours, but after a violent battle on the steps of Congress, 
Police eventually regained control of the building and pushed the angry crowd back beyond the perimeter. At last, lawmakers can return to the task at hand. It's early on January 7, 2021, when Vice President Mike Pence certifies the election results. And after one of the most contentious elections in the nation's history, the United States has a new president. But to get there, it had to survive a violent assault on its democracy. This is not how things began in 1789. The country was united behind a unanimous decision of the Electoral College. Partisanship was an anathema to George Washington. There were no parties, no political machinery. There was no scandal. There was no rancor. So it's a reasonable question to ask, how did we get here? From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. A 2017 Washington Post-Maryland University poll showed that over 70% of Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, agreed that politics in America had reached a dangerous low point. The tone of the 2016 presidential campaign was enough to make many Americans long for the good old days, the days when politicians put country over party, when the country's leaders respected one another in spite of their differences. But did the good old days ever exist? Probably not. George Washington reviled partisanship, warning that political parties would lead to a spirit of revenge in American politics. Alexander Hamilton agreed, calling political parties a fatal disease. John Adams, writing to his wife about an upcoming presidential contest, once said, The electioneering campaign is opened already. I am determined to be a silent spectator of the silly and wicked game. In this series, we're going back to the very beginning to move forward chronologically in time to track how we got from there to here. From the first presidential election in 1789 to the upcoming election of 2020, this show will explore the elections that shaped the history of this country, the wars waged on the campaign trail, and the stories of the many who sought the highest office in American government and the most powerful political post in modern history. This is Episode 1, 1789 the Alpha and the Omega. It's March 15th, 1783 at noon. A group of high-ranking officers in the Continental Army gather in the Temple of Virtue, a large hall at the New Windsor Cantonment near Newburgh, New York. An intense debate is underway. The floor, gentlemen, give me the floor. This measure is nothing short of treason. No more treasonous than the actions of Congress. The issue on the table is a petition calling for the officers to mutiny. The officers want long overdue back pay for them and their men, plus money for the Army's pension fund. If Congress refuses to pay, the petition calls for the Continental Army to march into unsettled territory and leave the American people to fend for themselves against the British. Tell me, gentlemen, if the British surrender, what will you do then? We'll march on Congress and hold them in gunpoint till they pay. I say we put it to a vote. Just then, a door in the back of the hall swings open. When the men see General George Washington standing in the doorway, a hush falls. The officers stand and salute their general. At ease. He is a giant of a man, standing six feet tall and weighing well over 200 pounds. As Washington walks slowly to the front of the room, no one says a word. He steps before the men, produces a stack of papers from his coat pocket, and begins reading. Gentlemen, by anonymous summons, an attempt has been made to convene you together. How inconsistent with the rules of propriety, how unmilitary, and how subversive of all order and discipline. Washington reads his speech word for word, all nine pages of it. He implores the officers to hold the line, to trust in Congress, to give their country more time. He swears he will do everything in his power to encourage the government to do the right thing and give them the money they've rightfully earned. Then he takes something else out of his pocket, a letter from a member of the Continental Congress. 
<clears throat> Washington pauses for a moment. He squints at the paper, the words too small for him to make out. So he reaches into his coat pocket and produces a pair of spectacles. Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. When Washington finishes, the officers are visibly moved, some even to tears, but all to action. Within minutes, the officers do hold a vote, but not on the mutiny petition. Instead, roused by the words of this inimitable hero, the officers vote unanimously to stand with Congress, the government, and the American people. As he had done so many times before, General Washington saved the country, this time from mutiny. But for the nascent government of America, the internal strife is far from over. And for George Washington, even as the bloody war winds to an end, his days of service to his country are just beginning. In the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, politics was the furthest thought from George Washington's mind. There was only one thing he wanted, to return home to Virginia and to his wife Martha to live out his days in peace and solitude at Mount Vernon. In September of 1783, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the Revolutionary War officially came to an end. Two months after that, on November 25th, Washington led his troops on a victory march through New York City. He chose November 25th, or Evacuation Day as it would come to be known, for a specific reason. He chose November 25th because that day, the last of the British troops boarded their vessels and left American soil. The march began in what is today Union Square and moved north. Along the parade route, Washington stopped for a drink at Bull's Head Tavern, a cattle market on the corner of Bowery and Delancey. There, along with a cheering crowd of New Yorkers, Washington and his men raised a glass to liberty and freedom. A young woman in the crowd who witnessed the famous toast would later write, I looked at them and I thought upon all they'd done and suffered for us. My heart and eyes were full, and I admired and gloried in them all the more because they were weather-beaten and forlorn. Washington and the Continental Army had sacrificed much. Thousands of soldiers died in the fight for freedom against the British. But the war was won, and the army reveled in a massive celebration that lasted over a week. On December 4, 1783, Washington called the officers of the Continental Army to the Francis Tavern on Pearl Street for a feast. Washington chose that venue because the tavern had been a meeting place for the Sons of Liberty. Its owner, a man named Samuel Francis, had saved Washington's life by subverting an assassination plot. But on the evening of December 4th, Washington stood in front of the officers who helped him win the war and offered some parting words. With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. That night, Washington left New York and set sail for Annapolis, Maryland. There, he resigned his commission as General of the Continental Army, mounted his horse, and began the journey home to Virginia. Washington arrived at Mount Vernon on Christmas Eve, 1783, his first Christmas at home in nearly a decade. The holiday celebration lasted for nearly two weeks. In addition to the bottomless jugs of whiskey and endless pounds of bacon, Martha no doubt prepared her famous great cake, complete with 40 eggs, four pounds of butter, four pounds of sugar, and four pounds of fruit mixed with mace, nutmeg, wine, and brandy, and baked for five and a half hours. After a decade of bloodshed, it was a merry affair. Washington ate and drank, surrounded by friends and family and his loving wife. Martha would write that she hoped, from this moment, we should have been left to grow old in solitude and tranquility together. Later that month, Washington wrote, I feel myself eased of a load of public care. I hope to spend the remainder of my days in cultivating the affections of good men and in the practice of the domestic virtues. Washington enjoyed the domestic life. He liked dancing, hunting, and fishing, even attending the occasional play. But at his core, Washington was still a military man, and he stuck to a rigid schedule. Up every day at 4 a.m., breakfast at 7, dinner at 4. After tending to his affairs, he would take a daily horseback ride around his plantation. More than anything else, Washington loved farming. He would later say, I had rather be on my farm than be emperor of the world. Not long after he returned home, Washington wrote to the revolutionary hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, 
I am become a private citizen on the banks of the Potomac, and under the shadow of my own vine and my own fig tree, free from the bustle of a camp and the busy scenes of public life, I am solacing myself with those tranquil enjoyments. But Washington's retirement would be short-lived. If his body was focused on the affairs of Mount Vernon, his mind began to drift to the affairs of state. The post-revolutionary war government, defined by the Articles of Confederation, was hanging on by a thread. Under the Articles, America was less a country and more a loose league of independent nations, the 13 states. The U.S. didn't have a uniform currency. It didn't have a military force or the power to regulate trade or collect taxes. And on these and all other issues, the 13 states agreed on virtually nothing. In January of 1784, Washington wrote to a colleague, The disinclination of the individual states to yield competent powers to Congress for the federal government will, if there is not a change to this system, be our downfall as a nation. He went on to write, Like a young heir come into a large inheritance, we shall wanton and run riot until we have brought our reputation to the brink of ruin. For years, Washington grappled with the push and pull of his desire for a peaceful retirement and his growing concern for the viability of the country. Two years later, in the summer of 1786, he wrote to John Jay, Retired as I am from the world, I frankly acknowledge I cannot feel myself an unconcerned spectator. It having happily assisted in bringing the ship into port, and having been fairly discharged, it is not my business to embark again on a sea of troubles. That fall, in October of 1786, Washington received a letter from Henry Knox, a former officer in the Continental Army. A rebellion was brewing in Massachusetts. Knox wrote, In one word, my dear general, we are in dire apprehension that a beginning of anarchy with all its calamities has approached. The issue was money, or lack of it. After the Revolutionary War, America was in an economic crisis. The U.S. government was deeply in debt, and so were the states. This led to the liberal printing of paper money, which drove up inflation and sent debtors deeper into financial ruin. Nowhere, though, was the pain greater than in the state of Massachusetts, and no group felt the pain more than its farmers. To pay off its war debts, Massachusetts increased land taxes. From 1776 to 1786, taxes increased 1,000%. So by 1786, the average Massachusetts farmer was required to pay about one-third of his annual income to the state. Because inflation had rendered paper money nearly worthless, both creditors and the government began demanding repayment in the form of specie, gold or silver. But hard currency was in short supply, especially for debt-burdened farmers in states like Massachusetts. One of those Massachusetts farmers was a former captain in the Continental Army named Daniel Shays. By the fall of 1786, Shays was broke and deeply anxious that his small farm was about to be seized by the taxman. Everywhere he looked, Shays saw local jails filled to the brim with farmers like him, and he thought, if this was the liberty he had fought and bled for on the field of battle, he wanted no part of it. In response, he didn't print a letter or stage a protest at City Hall. He put on his old military uniform, took up arms, and raised a militia. Together, he and his men began training for combat. Shays led his men on an increasingly violent campaign. They attacked courthouses and government buildings, as word spread around New England, like-minded Americans flocked to his cause. Within a matter of months, his ragtag gang of farmers and war veterans had grown into an army 1,500 strong. Shays soon set his sights on sacking Boston, but to do that he would need weapons. So in January 1787, Shays led his men in an attack on the Springfield Arsenal, the first federal armory and the largest stockpile of weapons in the United States. George Washington wanted a peaceful retirement in Virginia, but he also realized that the fragile American Union was a powder keg. In August of 1787, with Daniel Shays and his militia on the march, that powder keg looked ready to explode. It's January, 1787, on a frigidly cold afternoon in Springfield, Massachusetts. General William Shepard sits on his horse in front of the Springfield Arsenal. Behind him stand 1,200 militiamen, mainly veterans of the Revolutionary War. 
In the distance, Shays and well over a thousand of his men approach the battlefield. To General Shepard, Shays men don't look like soldiers. Some are armed with muskets, but most wield clubs and pitchforks. They're just farmers. He turns to his lieutenant. Position the cannons. Yes, sir. From the rear of Shepard's line, the gun crew hauls a mass of cannons from the Springfield arsenal and places them at the front of the line, directly in the center of Shepard's ranks. About 150 yards from the arsenal, Shays orders his men to halt. Shays and Shepard dispatch their aides to ride out for a parley in the middle of the snowy battlefield. As the men speak, their breath steams in the frigid air. Shepard's aide is getting frustrated. If you advance on the arsenal, General Shepard will open fire. This is all we want, sir. Tell Captain Shays to disperse and his life will be spared. Tell General Shepard that if this matter is not settled by sundown, New England will see such a day as she has never seen before. This is your final warning. In the name of God and country, stand down. Captain Shays is here in defense of that country you are endeavoring to destroy. This is your final warning, sir. As Shays' men break parley and ride back to their lines, Shepard focuses his gaze on the rebel leader. Shays raises his sword and calls out to his men, ordering them to march. As Shays and the rebels advance, Shepard can hardly believe his eyes. Your orders, General Shepard? Fire warning shot. The cannonball flies over the heads of Shays' men, but Shays doesn't relent, and his men march on. Fire again. This time, the cannonball sails just a few feet over their heads. The rebels are nearly within musket range, but Shays does not sound a retreat. Your orders, sir? Fire everything we've got into their ranks. Yes, sir. The gun crew loads the cannons and lowers the aim a few inches. Ready, aim, fire. When the smoke cleared, Shays and his men were in full retreat. Four Americans were dead, and as many as 20 more lay wounded in the blood-drenched snow. Within the week, Daniel Shays and his rebels, surrounded by state troops, would surrender and return to their homes in defeat. Shays' rebellion, as it came to be called, was over. But for many of America's founding fathers, including General George Washington, the battle at the Springfield Arsenal was an omen of turmoil to come. Ten years after the Declaration of Independence and four years after winning the Revolutionary War, American citizens were slaughtering each other on the field of battle. The nascent country, not yet even fully formed, was at serious risk of self-annihilation. On February 3, 1787, just over a week after the battle for the Springfield Arsenal, George Washington took up pen and paper and wrote a note to Henry Knox. If three years ago any person had told me at this day I should see such a formidable rebellion against the laws and constitutions of our own making as now appears, I should have thought him a bedlamite, a fit subject for a madhouse. But such a rebellion had appeared, and at a tense time. The Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia was fast approaching, just a few months away, and Washington did not want to attend. For one thing, he had publicly promised to stay out of politics. If he re-entered the fold and went to the convention, he might be accused of holding political ambition, ambition more suited for the monarchical courts of Europe than the democratic halls of America. There was also a genuine concern that the convention, because of the state's competing agendas, would be a colossal failure. Washington had a personal concern, too. His wife, Martha, did not want him to go. He had promised her his retirement was permanent. All of this weighed heavily on his shoulders. The country he had fought so hard to free from the grasp of British tyranny was in jeopardy of self-destruction, and Washington's own legacy hung in the balance. He had promised to stay away from politics. He had dreamed of living out his days in peaceful tranquility and promised his wife he would. But in the wake of Shays' rebellion, Washington had little choice. In May of 1787, he left Mount Vernon on a carriage bound for Philadelphia. After the war, Washington's first election was not for the President of the United States. It was for President of the Constitutional Convention. In early May 1787, the delegates of the Constitutional Convention met in the old Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia, a building that would later be known as Independence Hall, the birthplace of the United States Constitution. 
There, on May 14, 1787, the delegates unanimously elected George Washington president of the Constitutional Convention. And shortly after the vote, Washington made his way to a tall wooden chair on an elevated platform at the front of the room. He demanded secrecy in the proceedings, ordering the windows and doors shut, a decision that worsened the already blistering summer heat. But inside that room, things got hotter. The unanimous election of George Washington as president of the convention was one of the few subjects on which the delegates would agree. At the outset of the convention, Washington was hopeful, writing, The sentiments of the different members seem to accord more than I expected they would, as far as we have yet gone. Because most delegates supported the basic premise of the new government, three branches of government, a system of checks and balances, but the devil was in the details and sharp clashes quickly emerged. Issues such as slavery, representation, and the disparate needs of the small and large states threatened the convention's success. It wouldn't be long before Washington's optimism gave way to dread. In early July, Washington wrote to Alexander Hamilton, I almost despair of seeing a favorable issue to the convention and do therefore repent having any agency in the business. A frustrated Washington lambasted the narrow-minded politicians who couldn't see beyond their local views and regional concerns. And no issue at the convention was more divisive than the question of the presidency. For many, the notion of a strong president who could veto the laws of Congress was tantamount to monarchy. Washington took the opposite view. He held a firm belief that a strong executive branch was necessary to a stable government. But in spite of his political conviction, during the debates, Washington remained largely silent. As the founders fought it out over the future of the country, Washington chose instead to listen and observe to keep order and do his best to forge consensus and compromise. And in the end, in spite of the vehement disagreements, compromise won the day. On September 17, 1787, after months of heated debate, the Constitution was born, an independent judiciary, a legislature with two houses that balanced the needs of the large and small states, and a strong presidency. The issue of slavery was shelved in order to secure support from the southern states, the Three-Fifths Compromise, which allows slave states to count three-fifths of their slave population, helped achieve representational balance between North and South. The new constitution was imperfect, but it passed with 39 votes of the 42 delegates present from the 12 participating states. Rhode Island had refused to participate. Washington called the outcome of the convention a miracle. He would write that the new constitution, despite its flaws, was nearer to perfection than any government hitherto instituted among men. But not everyone shared Washington's zeal. Patrick Henry, the famous revolutionary hero who said, give me liberty or give me death, had refused to even attend the convention. He would say of the new government, the principles of this system are extremely pernicious, impolitic, and dangerous. For Patrick Henry, the constitution was an invitation for monarchy. Still, despite fierce opposition, the convention's efforts were successful and the Constitution was sent off for ratification. It's not an overstatement to say that none of this would have been possible without George Washington. The South Carolina delegate, Pierce Butler, testified to Washington's impact. Many of the members cast their eyes towards General Washington as president and shaped their ideas of the powers to be given to a president by their opinions of his virtue. James Monroe, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, wrote, be assured, Washington's influence carried the government. In late September 1787, shortly after the convention came to an end, Washington set out to make the long trip back to Mount Vernon. He carried with him a four-volume set of Don Quixote he had purchased in Philadelphia the day the Constitution was signed. He was hoping to enjoy some light reading on the leisurely journey home. But Mother Nature had other plans in mind. When Washington tried to cross a bridge in the middle of a torrential downpour, his stagecoach slipped off the side. One of his horses tumbled over, plummeting 15 feet below and nearly pulling Washington to his death. But this wasn't the first time Washington had cheated the grave. During the Battle of Mongahela in the French and Indian War, his horse had been shot out from under him not once, but twice. After the battle, he ended up with bullet holes in his coat, but none in his flesh. During the Revolutionary War, Washington had fought at the Battle of Princeton. He seemed to literally dodge bullets as he rode his horse dangerously close to the British lines just 30 yards away. And during his lifetime, he contracted diseases from tuberculosis to dysentery, and each time he lived to tell the tale, 
a nearly unheard of feat at the time. Washington was lucky, and so was the nation. The Constitutional Convention of 1787 had been a success, and in the aftermath of the Constitution's ratification, the question of who would lead the new government, of who would be the nation's first president, was obvious to many, including Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton saw that a Washington presidency was essential to America's survival. He would write to Washington that if the first president failed, the blame will in all probability be laid on the system itself. Hamilton saw something else, too. A flaw in that system, a defect in the electoral process set up by the founders that could be exploited by Washington's enemies. In the election of 1789, Hamilton would put a scheme in motion to overcome that flaw, rally support, and sway the election in Washington's favor. Washington's influence had carried the Constitution, in large part because there was an assumption by many that Washington would serve as America's first president. But Washington didn't want the job. The task of convincing him to take up the mantle of the presidency would fall to his right-hand man, Alexander Hamilton. In August of 1788, Hamilton sent Washington a two-volume copy of the Federalist Papers, a collection of 85 essays written by Hamilton, with help from James Madison and John Jay. With the papers, Hamilton sent a letter. You will permit me to say that it is indispensable you should lend yourself to its first operations. It is too little purpose to have introduced a system if the weightiest influence is not given to its firm establishment in the outset. But Washington was not sold. President of the Constitutional Convention was one thing. President of the United States was another. In the late 18th century, serving in public office was an act of self-sacrifice a service performed for the common good, undertaken with humility and grace, and often at a real cost to a person's business and financial ambitions. Ambition for politics, especially for the office of the president, would have been seen by the public as tyrannical. Washington certainly knew this, but from his writings, it seems political optics were not his primary concern. Washington replied to Hamilton, for you know me well enough, my good sir, to be persuaded that I am not guilty of affectation when I tell you it is my sole desire to live and die in peace and retirement on my own farm. But Hamilton did not relent in his overtures. He wrote back to Washington, No other man can unite the public opinion or give the requisite weight to the office. In the end, Washington did agree to stand for president, but he did so with tremendous misgivings. But in 1788, there was another politician who did not have any compunction about standing in an election for public office. His name was John Adams. In June of 1788, shortly after Adams returned from Europe, he agreed to run for office. He famously told his wife Abigail that any position below vice presidency was beneath him. For Alexander Hamilton, Adams' ambition was a serious cause for alarm because the electoral system devised in the newly formed Constitution did not provide for electors to vote separately for president and vice president. This presented at least two potential issues. One, if there was a tie in the electoral college, the outcome of the election would be left to Congress. And two, a candidate for vice president could, in theory, receive more votes than the leading candidate for president. Hamilton was keenly aware of this. He wrote, Everyone is aware of that defect in the Constitution which renders it possible that the man intended for vice president may in fact turn up president. And for Hamilton, the prospect of an Adams presidency was too much to bear. So in the weeks leading up to the election, Hamilton approached a handful of electors, men from Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. He implored them to deny Adams their vote in order to ensure Washington's victory and block the way for an accidental Adams presidency. And in the end... Hamilton would get exactly what he wanted. On February 14, 1789, the Electoral College met in New York City. Washington was elected unanimously, meaning he received one vote from each of the electors. Adams was elected vice president with 34 votes. The rest were split between nearly a dozen regional candidates. Washington clearly would have bested Adams without the help of Hamilton's scheme but Hamilton's actions were a portent of what was in store for politics in America, and no one was more keenly aware of the danger that lay ahead than George Washington. 
After the votes were cast, it would take nearly two months for Congress to certify the election. During that time, Washington waited at Mount Vernon, his thoughts plagued by the ocean of difficulties that were in store for America. On April 6th, Congress finally certified the electoral votes. The next day, Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Continental Congress, left New York and made the 250-mile journey to Virginia. When he arrived at Mount Vernon, Washington was waiting for him on the front porch. Thompson read aloud from a document. I was honored with the commands of the Senate to wait upon Your Excellency with the information of your being elected to the office of President of the United States of America. Washington accepted. While I realize the arduous nature of the task which is conferred on me and feel my inability to perform it, I wish there may not be reason for regretting the choice. In Washington's Mount Vernon home, with little fanfare and no witnesses at hand, the American presidency was born. Two days later, Washington and Thompson would set out for New York. Before leaving, Washington would write again to Henry Knox. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to the place of his execution. It's April 30th, 1789 in Federal Hall on the corner of Nassau and Wall Street in Manhattan. Inside the packed congressional hall, the cheers of the crowd outside can be heard through the chamber walls. But the congressmen don't make a sound. They stand in reverent silence as George Washington takes his place at the front of the chamber. He looks the part of a confident leader, wearing a refined suit with powdered hair and a dress sword in his silver scabbard. But his shaky hands, haggard face, and careworn eyes tell a different story. Still, Washington musters a dignified posture as Vice President John Adams begins the proceedings. Sir, the Senate and House of Representatives are ready to attend you to take the oath required by the Constitution. In a soft, breathy voice, Washington replies simply, I'm ready to proceed. Moments later, Washington steps out onto a balcony overlooking the crowd of thousands below. As he appears on the portico, the crowd roars with delight. New York Chancellor Robert R. Livingston steps forward and presents a thick leather-bound Bible. As Washington places his hand on the book, a hush falls over the crown. Livingston administers the oath. Repeat after me. I, George Washington, do solemnly swear. I, George Washington, do solemnly swear. As Washington recites the words, his hand trembles. His thin, reedy voice shakes. Washington clearly feels the power of the moment and the heaviness of the words he's speaking. That I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. As Washington removes his hand from the Bible, the crowd is silent, unsure of how to react. No one in the crowd knows the words of the newly established constitutional oath. Even those who do know it can't hear Washington's voice from the balcony. Livingston comes to the rescue and breaks the silence. He steps forward and calls out, It is done. Long live George Washington, President of the United States. It's hard to know if Washington heard anything on that balcony beyond the deafening roar of the crowd. If Washington did decipher the shouts from below, there was one chant in particular that certainly would have given him pause and added to his anxiety. Long live the king. Washington did not want to be a king, and he never wanted to be president. But the loyal servant chose to forego personal desire and serve the country he loved. When Washington was elected, there were no protocols for the presidency, short of the few rules outlined in the Constitution. Washington understood that his every action would set precedent. And one of his first actions was appointing America's first cabinet, men with diverse political views. The cabinet wasn't even called a cabinet until years later, and it wasn't something provided for by the Constitution either. Washington's decision was meant to be an act of good faith, a gesture of unity, but the result was something altogether different. Even in the earliest days of Washington's first term, the country was bitterly divided. The contentious process of creating the Constitution had demonstrated that the country was fractured. North versus South, industry versus agriculture, big states versus small, the haves versus the have-nots. Out of this myriad of divisions, two political factions would emerge. Federalists, like Alexander Hamilton, supported a strong federal government. Anti-federalists, like Patrick Henry, favored the rights of the states. In Washington's cabinet, 
these two forces would collide. From day one, the Founder's Garden of Hope began to weed. The seeds of partisanship had been planted at the Philadelphia Convention, and a two-party system had already begun to take root. During his first term, Washington would have to reap what political rivalry had sown. This is Episode 1 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1789, The Alpha and the Omega. On the next episode, the election of 1792, as Washington grapples with the idea of a second term, Vice President John Adams gears up for a fight to keep the vice presidency. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Stephen Walters. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck.